Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so we're going to try to keep it up to our 10 minute schedule. First of all, I'd like to congratulate not only the people that are standing here behind me, but the entire group. I mean, they were amazing. I'm sure all of you went through a lot of working this week, but these guys, they were working nights, they were like on the clock, grabbing some coffee, coming back. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better group, so a round of, of applause for them, please. So basically coming up to what we worked on, uh, our theme was uh, tackling or trying to find out about disinformation in anti-European Union groups on Facebook. Now, our first step was group selection. We used uh, search engines, other social media platforms, a lot of places to search for links to groups that were anti-EU on Facebook. We also searched within Facebook, of course, and we ended up with a couple of hundred groups that either in their cover image or in their profile image or in the about section were clearly somehow anti-European Union. Now from that we uh, ended up with 42 groups that uh, comprised three criteria. So basically they had over 1,000 members, they've had more than 100 posts in the last 30 days, and they would be in one of the languages that the, the group uh, spoke. So this would be German, Czech, and English. We also, uh, include, they, we also found some groups of other languages, but they didn't meet the other two criteria. So then we focused on extracting uh, all the posts from these 42 groups through CrowdTangle for the week of the 7th to the 15th of January. Now from those posts, we focused on the top 60 posts with more interactions. Now you can see the difference that actually there were in this week 10,000, more than 10,000 posts, and we actually only saw 60. But if you look at the interactions, it's quite a huge number. So we saw about 12% of the interactions, the posts had in total almost 60,000 interactions. So they were pretty viral. Now from those 60, we went on fact checking and debunking each one of them. So as you may figure, these guys were like with, loaded with work. After that, we got to the red flag posts, which we characterized and identified main narratives. We also tried to find among the red flag posts, sharing patterns, agents, and impacts. And that's what they're gonna speak about now. Okay, so, perfect. Um, our first research question was, is there any political disinformation in anti-EU Facebook groups? So you can look at the graph here. The answer is yes. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, so of the, uh, the posts that we reviewed, again, this was just sort of uh, the most viral posts of the last week. A uh, significant portion, about 52%, were uh, misinformative or disinformative in some way. So if you look at the orange section, those were the ones that were sort of more misleading. The red section is, um, is sort of the, the worst cases that we saw. Uh, of course, that means that uh, about 48% was sort of not misleading. They were accurate articles that were represented accurately on Facebook. Uh, but still, it seems pretty significant that about 52% of the posts were problematic. Um, subsequent groups will go into kind of the tags that we used to identify things as problematic. Um, but generally speaking, more, more posts than not were, were of some kind of problematic type. Uh, it's worth noting also that as we were reviewing these posts um, later, we had already found that within the week, I mean like really within the, the last couple of days, already about 16% had been taken down. We can't tell if that was a result of Facebook or if the users themselves removed them, but that should sort of, uh, it lends credence to the fact that these were like really pretty pr problematic posts. Um, how do I switch it? Is that? Yeah, here. There we go. Uh, so the next research question would be what were sort of some of the main themes uh, of these posts? 
So uh, this sort of bubble graph that we have for you, um, the size of the bubble indicates uh, this, the number of posts on that topic. The overlaps are meant to show sort of um, overlaps in themes. So for example, the Harry and Meghan uh, theme overlapping with overspending and misuse of public funds is, of course, going to be posts that talk about, um, you know, Harry and Meghan leaving uh, England and it, it, you know, resulting in some sort of uh, spending of taxpayer dollars. Um, so these were the main themes. They overlap in various places. Brexit was obviously sort of very hot and especially in the last week. So that um, sort of dominated the conversations that were anti-EU. Um, but there were other themes that arose that were also sort of regionally specific. So there was a lot of um, anti-green party and anti-left environmental sort of topics that were specifically coming out of Germany. There were a lot of anti-immigration topics, um, especially among the, the British and Czech posts that we saw. Let's see. But in terms of which of uh, the content was actually um, disinformative and anti-EU specifically, because obviously Harry and Meghan is not especially an anti-EU topic. Um, about 42% of posts were anti-EU, of disinformative posts were anti-EU. Um, let's see. Of the ones that were sort of not anti-EU, there wasn't a consistent theme, but there did seem to be a sort of uh, confirmation of findings from other research that suggests that there is a co-occurrence of engagement with tabloids and, um, and fake news, or tabloid-like information. Um, so secondly, we analyze what techniques were the most uh, used to spread fake news or misinformation on Facebook. And one we can see is that the two most kind of misinformation are inaccurate facts and timing out of context, which is when someone share, um, shares old information, for instance, something that's happened two years ago. Uh, another technique that is often used is uh, recycling news. In this case, uh, the goal is to use an old story to argue a point of view on a current debate. We also found quite a lot of unsubstantiated or unfounded accusations, as, well as, as well as image spin. Finally, incorrect, incorrect title links are commonly used by mainstream media to attract readers. Even if um, when we read the art article, we understand that the title is wrong or just exaggerated. Uh, so ne the, the next question was uh, how much of this disinformation results from actions inside the platform, therefore Facebook, and how much uh, is outside of platform? Uh, this was an interesting question because Facebook likes us to believe that uh, if uh, that the inter interactions coming coming mostly outside of platform and they therefore they cannot uh, really do much about it. But what we found out. Uh, uh, looking at the 33 misinformative or potentially misleading posts is that uh, uh, only 33.3% were exclusively out of Facebook and 67.7% uh, were native to Facebook in some way. Uh, so it means that uh, maybe some articles were written outside but it was posted on Facebook uh, as a recycled post or uh, it was posted out of uh, uh, timing out of context and uh, this led basically to making early relevant article that had maybe correct information uh, now misleading to users because they might think that the information in the article is relevant today. Yeah. <laughs> Then, we try to understand if there are some actors or agents that are pushing fake news more than others in social networks. What we found out from these uh, 60 viral posts is that uh, over 50% of these were published by accounts that were multi-posting. So more than one post from the 60s were from the same accounts and that they were active on several different groups. So a huge part of these posts were from accounts that were publishing around Facebook. Um, one narrative that was rising this week, which is a known narrative that has been on and off in England, 
It's the one about the fish trade, the fish rights, the fishing rights. And in this case, we noticed that uh, there were some main actors that are pushing fake news around this subject. For example, the Twitter of Jane Mamory, which uh, yeah, led us to the idea that uh, agents may be more pushing narratives than fake news generally, or uh, they, try, they tend not to stick to some newspapers specifically, but to a narrative, to a specific narrative that is repeated in different newspapers with different terms, but in this case it was, at least we flagged it as fake news. And most, the, the newspaper that most, uh, mostly provided fake news were the Daily Express and the Daily Mail. Nonetheless, we found fake news among the whole landscape of, of news that we, newspapers that we analyzed. Most of the, of the fake news were spread on right-wing group or like racist groups on Facebook. Uh, this, of course, uh, well, this, that's, what, from, <laughs> that's those are the groups that, the, from where we started from, you know, looking for the news. So that kind of makes sense. But then looking closely at one narrative, the one about immigration, we confirmed this. So 95% of the fake news or the news with the narrative of immigration were spread among the right-wing groups. And only a couple of news pieces were among the left groups or anti-racist and uh, Europe United and these kind of names. And the main difference was that this news that went viral on the left side were not giving much about the content of the article in the title. So this could have been a reason why they were not spread so much in the, in the right wing. So uh, we've also been working on the question, what is the weight and impact of these information narratives and who and what do they target? Um, first of all, the 31 Facebook posts we pinned as disinformative or misleading accumulated more than 9 million interactions over the past seven days only on Facebook. Um, we also find out that some topics were preferred to be shared on Twitter, like uh, Brexit and anti-EU material, climate change and foreign and religious subjects. On Reddit and YouTube, disinformative posts did not really um, got on the platform and thus did not generate as much as uh, engagement as in Facebook. In our research, we could also see on Google Trends that um, requests were directed by topics. Uh, we found this example of Shalina, Jan Mohamed, and uh, Starbucks CEO case, for which it was really easy to see that the pics of interest was related with the date of uh, article release. And here's a, an example explained. So. Just to show you an example, the Starbucks CEO was targeted with racism allegation. The fake story was first released in 2015, but according to Google Trend, the peak of interest is on the exact same day as the article was released in 2020. This shows that a certain amount of people have been confronted with the narrative, and this interest, interesting finding here is that all the research on Google search engines appears to be made in Texas, so rather a really conservative state. So to finish it off, what can be done actually about this? Now, uh, let me get my notes, because otherwise. Yeah, so basically one of the issues that we really noticed was really big was the issue of time. So the fact that posts would be recycled and again published um, out of context, leading people to think it's new news when actually it's old news. And some of the data would be actually incorrect according to the time, the current time. So uh, four ideas we came up with be one of them Facebook having, having the um, date of original publishing of the link visible in the timeline. The other one would be that newspapers, for example, mainstream media would have an archive subdomain or the image in sepia in such a way that visually people could understand their old news and they're not current. Or even for some articles, for example, to have over the headline, like a big news saying, follow up, there's been developments on this issue, please read this other article. Uh, another thing was the existence of like not a lot of difference between verified and unverified uh, 
pages, mainstream established media and others. So another of our suggestions would be that there would be somehow form of register that uh, people and just like credit cards do could actually be responsible for a page and have to show like their identification or register as an institution so that it wouldn't be anonymous. Now then another issue is that regulation it needs to adapt to current reality. So uh, because we're seeing a lot of clickbait and incorrect titles including in really respectable um, news establishments, uh, one of the issues would be that there should be more regulation and fines to the fact that you use a title that's actually not correct and does not uh, actually portray what is in the arc article. Another solution would be for you to be unable to re-edit or change links and posts after you've published them so that this can be as easy to be done. Uh, and also uh, very important would be that fact-checking networks, us academics and journalism all together, just like we did, would be more proactive and not wait for users and platforms to signal this information and we would go to search for them uh, ourselves. Finally, uh, in Portugal we have a saying that after like uh, the house is stolen, you lock the door, but actually it does apply because one of the other solutions we came up was when Facebook recognizes a disinformative narrative, they could actually somehow let people who have interacted with that narrative know that they've been um, visualizing like fake news. Thank you very much for your time and that would be all.